Welcome to my video. So this video is about a game I played. It was a 10 minute game I played on chess.com. And the theme of the video is calculation, chess calculation, not like, you know, quantum physics calculation, you know, that's way above my pay grade. But what is chess calculation? And why is it important? So chess calculation is essentially, you know, just being able to see moves you know just like in advance like you're looking at the board you're not moving the pieces around but you visualize you know what's going to go on like i know a lot of you have probably seen like queen's gambit i haven't actually but i am reading the book which is probably just better <laughs> but uh you know there's like some scenes where like you know the protagonist like you know is just like visualizing chess positions like in her head like i think looking at the roof or something so that's chess calculation and when i have students that's one of the very first things that I trained them. And one of the main things I trained them, you know, throughout the course of our tenure, which is just like calculating variations. And I believe that's important, one, because that's how my coaches taught me is like anything that people taught me that was successful, I'm going to like pass along to other people. But also it's important to calculate in your games so that you're prepared for everything. So that, you know, if your opponent plays a move that you missed, you know, or that you could have missed, you didn't miss it because you calculated it. And then also just like being more accurate with variations rather than just assuming that, you know, a certain move works. So yeah, we're going to be looking at this game. Now I will disclose some of the calculations in this game would have been hard in a 10 minute game, even hard for me to perform. Cause you know, just like with 10 minute, you know, you're not relying that much on calculation, sort of like blitz where you're just playing by intuition. Although I do still think that it is very instructive to look at this game, look at the mistakes I made and how I could have improved on them. So yeah, with that said, we'll take a look at the game and I'll see you there. All right, guys, let's take a look at this game. So I'll breeze through the opening. The opening details aren't all that important uh, after Bishop F4. So I've played against this variation actually with Black a few times. And after Bishop F5, most common move is to go g4 and the idea is simply to harass the bishop and if the bishop retreats you have like h4 h5 and just like belligerently attacking the bishop as well as the king side i didn't do that i played a little bit of a calmer approach with this move knight g to e2 and the idea is just to go knight g3 and harass the bishop that way so that's exactly what i did bishop g6 and this is the first position where I sort of left the theory. Now, to be completely honest, it's been a while since I studied this. I just played the move bishop d3, which is not bad. Just tr trying to trade the bishops, possibly just developing, preparing to castle. But apparently, believe it or not, h4 was the theoretical move. What do you think the idea was? h5. You know, not much to it. Just h5, try to harass the bishop. Uh, I don't know what the opening is uh yeah it's just, it just says black's gonna go h5 and like yeah, then bishop d3 yeah there's some theory there apparently so anywho i played bishop d3 and we just played some here i played this move f3 the idea is to expand with e4 and you know my holistic idea is just to have two pawns in the center which is good for you positionally because you just have a lot of leverage with your pieces your pawns control like say let's say like a5 something like that your pawns control a lot of squares, you have leverage for your pieces, you know, things like that. There can be some drawbacks, like this pawn could be a weakness, you know, sometimes knight g4, knight e3 is effective. Not here because of the bishop, but, you know, just in the future, it could be a liability. So, uh, yeah, anyway, so that's my idea with f3. It's pretty common, sometimes f3 can be used to just, like, catapult, like, an e-pawn advance. So that's just a good... Uh, strategic concept to keep in mind and that's what i did and in this position my opponent played a move that i admittedly missed uh they played this move queen b6 which simply forks two pawns and yeah i just missed it now it's not that big of a deal and i'll actually give you a little bit of a pop quiz which pawn do you think i should protect and why so I do need to protect the d-pawn. The d-pawn is far more important than the b-pawn. So let's say I play a move like b3. Well, okay, b3 would blunder this with check. So let's just say that like I play like queen c2 or something. 
it's not even about them taking with check. That's not even that big of a problem. But a center pawn is way more valuable than a flank pawn. So, I mean, you know, there's the same... I mean, they say that, like, pawns are worth one, you know, which is somewhat true, but you could think of it as, like, maybe this pawn is worth 1.2, and this pawn is worth, like, 0.8 or something like that. These aren't, like, exact, like, calculated numbers, but you sort of get my idea, because this D-pawn has an effect on the board. It's controlling some critical squares, whereas this pawn's not doing much. Like, I can just give it up. And actually, if you look at my position, I played rook c1 just to protect the knight, my position's not half bad. I mean, I have a lot of active pieces. Uh, that b1 squares into piece, but I have a lot of active pieces. Their queen is sort of like, you know, just, just kind of gone off hunting on the b2 square. You know, what's it doing, you know? So, yeah, I, I have a pretty good position for the pawn. And in this position, my opponent played the move c5. Now... I played a move which I also thought was good, which was this move e5, because I'm attacking the knight, and as you'll actually see, the knight does not really have a good safe square. Uh, this is also covered. Uh, so the knight is almost trapped, and we'll look at that variation later. Apparently I did have a little bit of a better move. In this position, I could have played this move knight b5. Now, what's the idea behind knight b5? There's an immediate threat on the c7 square with a fork, forking the rooks. So I'd be winning at least an exchange there. And I looked at this variation, well not during the game, when I was analyzing after. And after rook c8, let's say, protecting the c7 square. What you notice about this move, knight b5, is that I blocked the queen's access from being able to escape. So believe it or not, after some computer insane variations, the queen is just toast. I start with the move rook f2. Queen only has one square, which is b4. I go bishop d2. Queen is trapped, except for one square, which is back to the b2 square. But then after rook c2, the queen is bottled up. Now, these are precise computer variations, and I don't think this was a force variation. There might have been other ways for me to do it, but it's pretty instructive given that I move the knight to b5, not just to be able to fork on the c7 square, but... Uh, <clears throat> it is pretty instructive that not only do I play knight b5 to threaten the fork, but the queen is trapped. It's deprived of its escape. Now, black does have some compensation, I think, after, like, queen c2, maybe queen c2, there's, like, this opening up the rook, and, like, some of their pieces are pretty active, so... Black has a little bit of compensation. They're not dead lost, but that would have been a pretty cool variation to find. So after the move c5, I played the move e5, and my opponent played knight g4. Actually, I meant to put this on, but yeah, knight g4, which is a blunder. Now, you're thinking exactly what I thought when I first saw this. Just take the knight. Then I realized, oh, if I take the knight, they take my bishop. With an attack on my rook, it's not that easy. So this was a critical moment. You know, it's like, you know, the knight is hanging. What do I do? Maybe I take this. Maybe I like do something totally different. This is attacked. What do I have to do? So this is actually like the first calculation exercise that I bestow upon you. So this is white to play. And what would you do in this position and justify it with calculation? And also... Think about an alternative you might have thought about and why it's not as good. So while you're thinking, I will take a sip of my water. All right, so if you need more time, feel free to pause the video some more. Now, what I'm going to do is, so I discussed calculation and the key to calculation is seeing variations without moving the pieces. So what I'm going to do first is simply draw the variational arrows and then we'll go over them with the actual pieces. But, you know, this is just a train calculation, just train that visualization. So essentially how I saw it is I have two options. I can take the knight and allow this or I can take the bishop. When they take my knight, I have like options like maybe try to sack and like try to do something. So what I should have done actually is 
I should have taken the knight. And, you know, if they take my bishop, then my rook is attacked. I do believe I can play move like rook f2, and I'm just doing totally fine, but computer was even saying I can sack the exchange with a move like knight d5. And even though they take my exchange, I just have very active pieces. And I'll actually show this. It's not all that complicated. Uh, sorry. So takes, takes, knight d5. Knight d5 is like the computer move. I think a more human approach would be like rook f2 and then just like double or play knight d5 at some point. Because if you double first, then you hang the knight. Like say they play like a6 and you double. Oh, sorry. If you double, then they take. So uh, yeah, don't, don't listen to me. But you know, just rook f2 and like, yeah, you can play like knight d5. The point is... Well, actually, I'll backtrack this a little bit. I do think actually, practically, giving up the exchange makes sense. Because now all of your pieces are super active. You have this knight. Well, one, you're threatening You're threatening the knight here. So that's like a bonus. But, you know, the bishop could come in. The knight could come in. The rook could come in. You know, sometimes, as you see, my opponent's up three points of material. However, when I look at the computer eval, it's like plus three in my favor. So... This is a good lesson that sometimes, you know, piece quality is way more important, can be way more important than, you know, just like who's up material and by how much. Like, you know, black is up in material, but none of that matters when their queen is just sitting there on B2 and like none of their pieces are activated. I have all these pieces ready to fly into the position. So, you know, that would have been a better variation. And... What I miscalculated, and once again, we'll calculate this. We'll, we'll move pieces here in a second. What I calculated is that after bishop g6, which is what I played, knight e3, I was going to go bishop h7. And I saw that if king takes, I could fly in with my queen. And then I saw if king h8, I could still fly in with my queen. And that's what I thought. I was like, yeah, I'm just going to play like that. You know, I'm just going to take on g6. That's sort of like the fancier option because then you have the option to like sack on h7 or you know take on f7 that was also a possibility one key component to calculation is seeing details and i missed a very simple detail after knight takes sorry so bishop takes knight takes e3 i miss that there's a checkmate threat on the g2 square so that means that after bishop h7 king h8 I can't play queen h5 because they have this checkmate threat looming. So, yeah, I mean, details are important in calculation. You know, what else is there to say? Now, if they were to take the bishop, I would be able to force a draw with queen h5 and queen f7, just go back and forth. I can't really do any more just because, once again, there's a checkmate threat. However, my opponent did the correct thing by going king h8 and not, you know, forcing the draw because, you know, they're going to be like up in material and like there's still something to play for. So I played the move queen f3, which protects the g2 square. My opponent took the rook and in this position, I just need to take the knight back and like, you know, they can't really take the bishop because I have queen h5. And now that there's no longer a mate threat, I would have time to like, you know, just like improve my attack. Like it's completely winning for white. So, uh... I should have just done that. And once again, I'm down in exchange, but my piece quality is superior. I mean, I have a bishop just right there on the h7 square that you can't even take. Uh, my knight's protected, which is important. So I didn't do that. I was like, wow, I'm going to smash mouth him with queen h5. But the problem with queen h5, and this is what I thought. I thought like, oh, he's going to take them to play bishop g6 and get queen h7, you know, just like get this nice fancy mating pattern here's the problem well my opponent actually has two moves both of them equally devastating they can play this and if i play bishop g6 queen h6 and they defend the mate there's nothing i can do i'm toast the other option which they could have done which i think might, might even be a little bit fancier is just knight takes g3 so the idea is now if I try to get some checkmate, then they just take my queen. And then, you know, after like knight g3, if, they, if I like take back, now they take my rook with check, which is devastating. And then they can always go queen h6. So after queen c1, I'm just toast. I played bishop f5 and tried to like just make the most of the situation. But at the end of the day, I just resigned here. 
yes, I can recapture the knight, but like I'm just down five points of material. They're just gonna take here and just have a pretty easy go at it. And it's just like, yeah. So I do think it's very important to calculate. As I explained earlier in the video, it's important to calculate so that you see variations in advance and you play them out in your head. And also it is important to see details. I miss those details of like, you know, the, just the checkmate thread on G2, or I'll show it. Uh, yeah, I missed after knight e3, there was a checkmate thread on g2, and then later I just missed that, like, queen c1, you know, just, just this is covered. So, you know, it's important to see these details, and yeah, that's just about it for my, my lesson, so I hope you had a great time watching this video. If you have any games you want me to analyze for this channel, I would be more than happy to do so. I am looking for some content ideas, so... I think with that said, I will let you guys go and I'll see you for the next video. Take care.